So I'm here with Tom Stark, who we I met last night, uh, and he's absolutely fascinating. So I figured folks might be interested in uh, a fascinating person. Um, do me a little favor and tell me uh, about uh, the book that you've got out and how that came to be. What's the story with that? Okay. Well, uh, Human Faces of God is the name of the book, and I just uh, it's sort of a distillation of just standard scholarly uh, materials that most graduate students have access to, but most uh, most Christians who don't go to seminary um, aren't aware of and so it was a uh, it's a, a collection of material that was really important to me in my personal faith journey uh, stuff that really helped transform my thinking about faith about uh, how we approach scripture um, and so it's a really personal book in that sense um, it began as a blog series that I did and I got so many emails and comments uh, from people saying that uh, the series was very helpful to them um, yeah. and so I decided to uh, make it into a book, Whip and Stock uh, decided that they would like to publish it, and so what it essentially is is it's a, a critique of an errantist uh, readings of scripture, an errantist, an errantist dogma. Um, I spend the first three chapters sort of dealing with uh, the tenets of inerrancy and and uh, deconstructing them and uh, testing them against the what they call the phenomena of scripture. Um, and then I spend five chapters dealing with some of the really problematic aspects of the Bible. I deal with uh, the development um, in Israel's theology from polytheism to monotheism. I show that uh, in the earliest texts um, the, of Israel, earliest Israelite texts, Yahweh was portrayed as the uh, son of a Canaanite deity, El Elyon, and then over time he evolved into sort of uh, the king, king of the pantheon and eventually became the only god in town, the only act in town, you know. Um, and then I deal with human sacrifice, um, look at some of the traditions that uh, suggest that human sacrifice was considered an acceptable practice in early Israelite religion, and look at the different and contradictory ways that some of the later prophets uh, sought to condemn the institution of human sacrifice. But so no, but when you're approaching all of these ideas, you're you're approaching scripture in a way that I think is different than the way a lot of folks either think themselves about it or have been taught to think about scripture. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what what you feel like you're doing when you come? To the book, like what, what's happening there? Yeah, well, part of it stems from my uh, my own faith tradition. I come from the Stone Campbell uh, Restoration movement, and it's sort of an anti-creedal um, tradition. Uh, the our only creed historically has been uh, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. Hmm. Um, not that I necessarily buy into all the um, the Baconian common sense uh, Enlightenment thinking that. Uh, that informed early Stone Campbell uh, ideas, but that tradition uh, in a general way informs the way that I look at the Bible and what I want to do is I want to see what what the Bible is actually saying in its historical context and I want to be honest about, about that um, first and foremost. Um, so that the Bible can, the Bible itself can speak to us, and then, and then we need to figure out how to appropriate it as scripture, rather than looking at the, rather than looking at the Bible as scripture, and trying to conform what it says to what we need it to say in order to have coherent Christian community. Huh. Um, and so, so you want to kind of put it the other way around, so that it's the Bible first. Mm -hmm. We come to it with a certain perspective and then it becomes scripture would you or, or then a, we interact a, with the description then we interact with the scripture in a sense that's what I, that's huh. that's what I want to do and of course I'm I, I'm sort of I'm trying to take Stone Campbell ideas to their logical conclusion which not necessarily uh, most of the Stone Campbell uh, sure. figures did um, but what I discovered when I tried to, tried to read the Bible as honestly as possible on its own terms is that the Bible disagrees with itself. Different writers in the Bible are arguing that the Bible itself is an argument with itself. They're arguing about the big questions. They're arguing about the meaning of it all. They're arguing about the ideas about the afterlife. They're arguing about what to make of suffering. And so I have come to see the Bible as that sort of argument, and it's the argument itself that is valuable for for me and for my community as Scripture, rather than needing the Bible to have, be a coherent, single yeah. voice straight from heaven um, that gives us a single message. It's interesting. I think about a, a Brueggemann right here who says that you know he understands. And he's using Mikhail Bakhtin, who's a kind of a, a literary 
the theorist, but he says that you know if 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 we think of the Bible, he, he talks about it in some of his interviews almost as if it's a party. Right. That when you walk through a party, you can kind of even though a, the party isn't an entity, there's different feelings that certain parties have. Right. It's just, so the Bible has a clear sense to it, and then he says, and furthermore, it, it's it wouldn't be much of a party if it had one voice. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And and he go he says that you know. Um, that uh, monologues are, necess- are necessary then for empire, sure and that you can't run an empire on dialogue. Yeah. And I think right. there's a huge yep. amount of wisdom there, especially in this day and age, and for those of us part of the Western okay. Church, mm-hmm. for, for understanding uh, Bible and Scripture. Be you know, thoughts on that or comments or? Yeah. Well, I think that's a I think that's a good image. Um, what I've come to see in, in, in my studies of the Bible, though, is that a lot of the voices are wanting to have a monologue. A lot of the voices in the text are wanting to have that monologue. They're wanting to over and that, against each other. Over and against one another. They're, they're, <laughs> right. It's not just a conversation. It's more like uh, uh-huh. rival <laughs> narratives. Um, and that a lot of a lot of which are imperialistic in in tenor, um, and so not everyone's playing nicely. Not everyone's playing nicely. If it's, <laughs> if it's a party, it's got many rooms and a lot of uh, uh, CD stuff is going on in some of the rooms. Um, <laughs> this so, is the back room yeah. where the Deuteronomic texts are exactly. fighting for yeah. urbanization. Oh, that's good. Right. So it's an interesting party, um, and uh, <laughs> yeah. But so my approach is, you know. I think that we need to be honest about the problematic aspects of, of a lot of these texts. And I deal with more than just the politics and the human sacrifice. I deal with genocide. I deal with uh, some of the uh, political propaganda uh, around King David. I deal with the uh, apocalyptic aspects of, of Jesus' uh, teaching and thought. Um, but uh, what I want to do is, uh, is approach these texts as honestly as possible and see what's really what these voices are really saying and then appropriate both critically and constructively. Um, understanding them in letting the voice really speak for themselves um, and out of their contexts and not trying to conform them uh, just to suit our needs as, as a faith community 2,000 years removed. So let ourselves be formed by it as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, yep. uh, let ourselves be formed by it, but not necessarily let it dictate to us how it ought to be forming us. We need to use discernment. I think that God continues to be active um, in, in the church and outside of the church. Um, and we have access to a kind of spiritual discernment uh, that we need to employ mm-hmm. when approaching these, these scriptures. And so uh, a metaphor that I use, an analogy that I use uh, in my final chapter is talking about uh, the way we appropriate authority figures in, in real life. Um, the, the inerrantist sort of approach to scripture is authoritarian rather than authoritative. Yeah. Um, and we don't... For instance, when we when we um, are growing up, we have this uh, rosy image of our parents, um, and we see them as the authorities on any question. Whatever they say is just gospel to us. Until one day we realize that they're not infallible, mm-hmm. um, and the adolescent attitude response to that it can go one of two ways: is to say, "Oh, well, they're they're um, not, they're not infallible, so I'm not going to trust anything they say." Or uh, to insist that they are infallible despite all evidence to the contrary. Um, and that's not really the way that a mature person appropriates uh, appropriates that. And so, so it's almost as if Christianity is in its adolescence, kind of in the in the in the kind of inerrance. And the inerrantists are the are the, the well the new atheists and and that sort those sort of fundamentalists would be the sort of petulant uh, uh, adolescent that saying well we're just going to reject the, the whole authority because they are wrong on some issues and the inerrantists are the are the younger sibling that insists no mom and dad are right, right. Yeah. yeah so so it's fundamentalism in either direction that right. you're trying to kind yeah. of shoot the middle of um, yeah. um, when we grow up and mature we recognize that even though our parents were right about everything, we have been formed by them in, in ways that uh, we'll never be able to fully understand, mm-hmm. and so we need to appropriate um, their, they become authoritative for us in a new way, mm-hmm. in a different way, yeah. and it's not from a top-down sort of sense, but it's from a ground right. up. Yeah. They have formed us, and we will always be formed right. by them, but we have to become our own persons. Yeah, right. and, I, and I would suggest that I think that 
part of the ways to kind of stay with this parental thing, part of the ways we start to learn or that I've started to learn and realize how my parents have formed me mm -hmm. is by having conversations with other people who are also reflecting on how their parents have formed yes. them. And so I would say that, you know, I mean, for folks who uh, kind of follow the image of fish, one of the things that I've been doing with what I call the, herald the heraldic theology is that communal hermeneutics mm -hmm. is necessary. Right. That it seems like that prayer of discernment, the, the acknowledgement that yes, God is working in the world uh, and helps us figure out how revelation is to be received, but it's not just me and the text it's me and God and the text and the community in which I'm participating right. currently so that yep. there's some linkage there to some of the uh, work I've been doing I think that's that community is kind of an essential part of that scholarly task absolutely and I would say communities um, not just the, the one community because I think that we would be isolating ourselves from viable voices from God right um, I would say, you know God is uh, active and speaks everywhere but one, one of the one of the things I like to say is if God can speak to Balaam through an ass, he can speak to a Baptist through an atheist. <laughs> Uh, and so, and so, we don't want to exclude. You, you mentioned that it's not just me, but it's me and the community and God. And and we want. I want to make sure not to exclude the individual. Um, we need to have individual readings. We need to have personal encounters with Scripture. We need to take our personal struggles to the text and, and personal our free struggles will. For, and our free will and and derive struggles from the text as individuals. But we need to take those those questions and those struggles to the community. Um, some of the community will benefit from our from our personal, and that's what community is, of course. Um, but then it's, it's not just the one community, it's not just the Christian community. Uh, we need to we need to be in dialogue as individuals and as and as whole communities with other with other traditions, with other communities, because we're, we don't have the full picture. Uh, the book is The Human Faces of God. That's right. And what's the publisher? Uh, Whip and Stock. Whip and Stock. And uh, thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Absolutely. Beautiful.